I wanted to talk about um, why I think string theory is probably right. Um, I'm not a string theorist, I'm a cosmologist. There is this debate, it's a, to an extent it's a debate within the scientific community. It's probably more of a, a debate which given, is given more credence, I think, by, by the public than, than within science itself. But, you know, what is the correct theory of, of, say, quantum gravity? Is it string theory or is it one of the suggested alternatives? And I'm in the string theory camp and I wanted to sort of say why, really. So string theory basically, in a nutshell, postulates that all the building blocks of nature. So you normally think of these as being like little particles. String theory says that, they're, well, no, they're not little particles. They're little tiny strings. So those strings can be either closed strings, so they're like a loop, a loop of string, or, um, or they're open strings, so there's like an extent of string. And uh, the different modes of vibrations of those strings give you the, the different particles that, that, you, that you perceive in nature. But even a, but a string is longer than a particle, so wouldn't a string need to be made of particles? No, it itself is the fundamental object. And when you look at it from, from uh, far away, it looks like a particle because you take it so far away, you can't you know, sort of resolve, resolve the distances. But, but um, yeah, it, I mean, fundamentally, it's a string and you, you can't break it down any further. It's the, it would be the fundamental object of, of nature. There's this sort of the old Aristotelian idea that uh, you, know, you break things down further and further. And of course, he, he postulates that you reach the atom, right? Of course, now we get to the atom and then we, we, go, we know you could go further, you could break things down even further. Well, actually, there is a point where that stops. And it stops at the string. That's it. There's no breaking down of the string. If you look at why, where the problems in, in quantum gravity arise, it's, uh, it, it's when um, you have point-like interactions. So when things are, are interacting at a point, particularly when gravitons are interacting at points um, and things that couple to gravitons. When that happens, you get divergences, you get infinities, and these are infinities that you can't handle. Sometimes you get these sorts of infinities in other theories as well, within the standard model, for example, but you can handle them, right? In something called renormalization, you can't handle them within just gravity. So what string theory does is very loosely, it sort of resolves that by instead of things interacting at points, well, they can't interact at points anymore because the, the string has extent. It gives everyone a bit of leg room. If you like, yeah, yeah, it does. But, but what's important to realise is, is the, it wasn't like that was the order of the argument, okay? It wasn't like somebody just said, okay, well, let's just give it a bit of extent and that's going to fix everything. It's, it's like, you know, it, let's mix, imagine everything's made up of strings instead of particles. It's like, well, why strings then? Why not? It's just something different. Why, you know, snowflakes, whatever, right? It, it wasn't that, it, that these were plucked out of thin air. There was a natural progression that, that led to this, this idea. And I think that, that's, what's, that's what really convinces me. One of the things about theoretical physics is that, you know, on the one, it's not like we just sort of come up with an idea and then ask experiments to come along and maybe a hundred years after we've died to, to verify it. It's, it's not like, there's not an anything goes attitude. Physics is a, it's, it's, it's an old field now. It's, 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 it's more mature, it's been around for longer than, than say biology. So we've learned to develop a lot of rules of the game that we, we can't mess with. These rules tell us what we're allowed to do next, even before we even go to an experiment, because those rules came from experiment themselves, right? So in particular, the, the two big guiding principles that we have are special relativity and quantum mechanics. And just those two things, when they come together, they really restrict what we're allowed to do. And it leads you very naturally to something like string theory. Why, why do people, some people not like string theory? Well, string theory, it's hard, at the, is the bottom line, right? It, it's maybe, it's predicted lots of things, but, but in terms of actually, like one of the things that you wanted originally from string theory was um, a unique solution of string theory, a unique solution of string theory that, that describes, say, our universe, that is compatible with our universe. Now, string theory hasn't achieved that. But what, what you actually get out of string theory are loads of different possible scenarios, loads of different possible universes, truly gargantuan number. And ours could be one of them. Ours is compatible with one of them, but there's no unique solution. So you actually get this landscape. So a lot of people don't like that. And it make, they argue that maybe you lose predictivity. At the end of the day, what, you, what we really need is to, once we can understand the mathematics of the landscape more, we can start to make concrete statements. But it's, at, at this stage, we're not at that level. 
and the maths is tricky, but it, but but because of the trickiness of the maths, string theory has also brought lots of uh, important developments within within maths as well. But the reason I like it is is, is as I said is is, is the sort of there's a, a very natural progression of an idea that leads towards it, um, and it's it, it's the same thing that led inevitably to the to the Higgs actually. It's the same logic that led to, to the existence of the Higgs. When people talked about why the Higgs exists, right? They talk, you know, usually talk about, oh, because it gives mass to particles, or, or if they're being a bit more sophisticated, they might say, oh, because the symmetries are broken. And, and, the, and all that's true. But the real important thing about the Higgs is that it allows our theory of nature to obey the rules of special relativity and quantum mechanics in, in a very particular way. What you get when you, when you um, consider relativity and quantum mechanics together, you get a theory called quantum field theory, which is the most spectacularly beautiful theory that, that we've produced. It's remarkably well, um, uh, you know, well tested. It's, 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 it's a great theory, right? What, what are you really doing when you, when you do quantum field theory? Well, you're looking at how particles are interacting, right? So you might be interested in how electrons are interacting. So you fire two electrons at each other, and you ask what's the probability that they, they scatter by a certain amount, that they scatter through a certain angle. And when you do that, you, uh, you use quantum field theory to, to do that. It calculates something called an amplitude. And that amplitude tells you something about those probabilities. And when those electrons are, are interacting, they Quantum field theory tells us that they exchange a virtual particle, which is the photon. It's not a real particle. It's not a particle that you can grab and hold. It, it, it's a virtual particle. So it has real effects. It causes the, the um, electrons to scatter, but, but it's not a real thing. You can scatter these things, and you use quantum field theory to calculate these amplitudes and to, to extract probabilities. And when you do that for the electron, you get a sensible number. Okay, you get a nice... Uh, number which is nice and small so that we can retain perturbative control over our calculations and we can, we can uh, everything's sensible, okay. The trouble arises when you start introducing W bosons, which are a different type of particle, but just another particle. Uh, w bosons have, have mass. Uh, that means that they have an extra sort of component that they, would, that, they have, that, they, that they wouldn't have if they didn't have mass. So they have this extra component which is kind of like there because it's got mass. And this is the longitudinal component. And when you scatter the longitudinal components of W bosons, something goes wrong. It's all fine at low energies. At low energies it's fine. At high energies, these, you calculate these amplitudes and the numbers get big. They get big, big, and they translate ultimately to probabilities exceeding one. This is completely breaking down the quantum mechanics. So this tells you immediately that something's got to give, right? So you're like, well, what can I do? So you look, what you, what you can do is, is you can look at the, the expression, the formula you've got for your amplitude. And you can say, right, it's cool at low energies. I need to fix it at high energies. So I just change the formula. Okay, I just fix it, I just change the formula. But then you say, well, can I change it in any old way just so that it works well at high energies as well? Well, you can't just do anything. Again, quantum mechanics and relativity come and they tell you there's only certain things that you can do. You can't just do anything. So they tell you to look for where the, the poles, where, the, where things blow up in the amplitude. Look for the locations of these poles and look for the properties of these poles. These poles are where kind of the amplitude sort of spikes up. If it spikes up, you know, when you approach it from one direction, if it spikes up in one direction, that's good. If it spikes up in the other direction, that's bad. Because what, what are these poles they're telling you about when you do these experiments about producing a real particle? Not just a virtual one, but producing a real one. And they tell you about the properties of those particles. And if the spikes are in the wrong direction, that means you've got a bad particle, a particle that's inconsistent with quantum mechanics, a particle that will lead to negative probabilities and all kinds of madness. You do this, and you can do this in a, in a way that's consistent for the W bosons, right? And it turns out that the particle that you actually introduced into the game was the Higgs. So it softens everything up and everything's well behaved. So this is the lesson from Higgs. Now. Let's play the game of gravity. This is where string theory comes in. In gravity, you have gravitons, right? These particles of gravity, if you like. And you can scatter them as well. You can ask what happens. At low energies, everything's fine. At high energies, things start to get big and start to blow up. And this makes a, a, a nonsense of your probabilities again. So things have gone around, quantum field theory broken down. You know, you, you've lost control. 
And this is, this is what goes wrong with gravity. So you can say, right, I've got this formula again for the amplitude. Can I play the same game? Okay. Can I just say, right, I'm going to rewrite the formula so that I improve its behavior at high energies whilst keeping the same behavior at low energies. So they did it and they say, but then you can't just, again, can't just write anything because you've got to check where are the poles, what, are the, what, what kind of new things have I introduced, right? Are they consistent with quantum mechanics? And you try and you try and you try it, and it's really hard and it seems to be like there's nothing you can do. And then one day these guys, Virasoro and uh, Shapiro come along and they come up with an answer and it works. It doesn't introduce any crazy new particles. It introduces perfectly well-behaved new particles. And it's like, well, that's worked, right? It seems to have the same, it, it reproduces what we want to see at low energies. It has manifestly good high energy behavior. It's consistent. It doesn't introduce any pathological new species of particle or anything like that. It's great. And in the f you know, f nearly 50 years since this was found, nobody has come up with an alternative, right? Now, I haven't mentioned anything about strings at this stage, have I? Right. And this is the beauty of it. This is the beauty of it. All this was done before anybody mentioned the word string, right? But now you look at the formula that you've got and you say, can I interpret it? And you look at it and you realize that actually it's a formula that describes not the scattering of particles, but really the scattering of strings. So it wasn't that somebody said, oh, let's try strings. That was never what happened. You know, you had this formula, you, you thought, let's fix the formula, okay? Let, let's try to guess what the, how things are going to behave at high energies, what it has to do. And this is kind of almost a unique answer for what it could do. And there you go, lo and behold, it was string theory all along. Well, originally, of course, historically, they, they, were, they were looking at other things. They were looking at things trying to explain the strong interaction. But there's this logical argument that you can apply to gravity, and you realise that actually the... Um, out pop strings. It's not like you try strings, out pop strings. Now, of course, there are certain assumptions that I'm making here, like that you, you, you're doing a very standard way to try to extend a theory into, into the UV and you're keeping everything at weak coupling. That means that the interactions are not getting too strong. So there, there are some assumptions in what I'm saying, but it's a very natural progression of ideas that lead you along one path, and, and that's the string theory. And that's why I buy into it really. I think most people do buy into it. I think, I think, I think most people do. There are a, a community which, which don't. Uh, why don't they? Maybe, I don't know. That's a, that's a controversial thing to, to ask. What's I don't it, know. What's okay, so, so, so we mentioned a bit before about um, the fact it doesn't predict this unique state for the universe. It predicts all this gargantuan number of possibilities. That's a weakness in, in a way. Some people might interpret that as a virtue because when you've got so many possibilities, you're going to get one that's compatible with what we see, right? But it could also be described as a weakness. I don't think it's fair to say it's not really a testable theory. I think, I think that's, that's not true. Um, I think you can, for example, you assume that the symmetries of, of special relativity are present. Uh, and if we find any evidence that, that they're not, then that would be a, a proof against string theory. So it's, it's wrong to say that, it, that it's not... Um, that, that, it, that it's not a, a testable theory. A another issue that people might have with, with, with string theory, for example, would be um, the cosmological constant. We know that we see out there, we, we see the universe accelerating. That requires a positive cosmological constant. Just this parameter in your, in your physical theory, the vacuum energy of the universe should be positive. The energy of, uh, when you take everything out of the universe, the leftover energy, it should be positive. That would be compatible with this accelerating universe that we see. String theory doesn't really like that. It prefers either zero or negative. That's not to say it can't necessarily give you the positive one. There are some ideas out there which try to construct these, these within string theory. They have been criticized in some quarters. It's, it's cutting edge ongoing stuff, right? But that might be one perceived weakness of, of string theory, trying to get that positive cosmological constant out. But yeah, there are there are there is serious work out there doing that and, and indeed they claim to have done it. Is there an ultimate test or proof? Is there a, is there a silver bullet out there that you could say, look, string theorists were right all along? Well, I, I, think, I think there would be, yeah. I think, I think, so at the moment, so we talked about the formula, that, that this, this formula that sort of uh, Virasora and Shapira came up with that does everything it needs to do, right? Now, it's not been proved that that's the unique choice that you could have made. 
right? Given all the criteria that you want, that it reproduces the right things at, at low energies, uh, and it doesn't introduce any pathologies, you know, that violate quantum mechanics and all that. Is it unique? We don't know. If somebody comes along and proves that it is unique mathematically, which is, this is a mathematical exercise now, um, then I think that's a feather, that, then it's kind of like, it could only have ever been string theory, right? And you didn't have to do any experiment to prove that, or the only experiments you need to prove that are the experiments that confirm special relativity and quantum mechanics. So that for me would, would, would be, be it really. The other thing that string theory typically needs is, is supersymmetry. So um, if we found evidence of supersymmetry, then uh, that would be good of a string theory. Of course, we haven't found it. It's not going to be found at the LHC by the looks of it. But that's not to say that string theory is wrong. It just means that the supersymmetry kicks in at a higher energy that the LHC can't see. So you have two types of, of particles in nature. You have bosons and, and fermions. So, for example, the Higgs particle is, is a, like a boson. So is the photon is a boson. The graviton is a boson. They're characterized by the fact that they have integer values of their spin. It's like an intrinsic spin and they have integer values. There are also fermions. They have half integer spin, so things like the electron. And what supersymmetry does is it, it postulates a symmetry between these two kinds of particles. So for every boson you have a fermion, for every fermion you have a boson. Um, and yeah, that's what, so it kind of doubles up the number of particles, but it, it, it's a very natural extension of the symmetries that we know of. The, the, the next step up would be that you would include supersymmetry. So again, it's just a natural progression of ideas. And string theory requires it because without it, it predicts the, uh, it's unstable. It, it is the natural path of all the ideas that have been built up over the 20th century. That in a way, string theory is the natural place that you would go next. So I don't think you need a rewrite of anything. I think it would be the opposite. If string theory was found to, to somehow not be right, then you'd have to start thinking about rewriting all the textbooks, I think. It would be the other way around. I mean, the other thing I suppose that people, people would criticise string theory for, of course, is that it's a theory, it predicts the dimensionality of the universe to be um, 10 space-time dimensions which, you know, you look outside and there's, there's four, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. So where are the other six? But, but this, this is, this, you can easily, you know, you can imagine that they're wrapped up very small or that we live on a brain, a membrane or something like that. This is not, not really an issue. Yeah, you can see how truly big it is. I mean, it's, it's vast. You know, and it's kind of, I think it's crazy if you think that, you know, it's so big. And yet we're looking at something so small. Security onto us. They found out we're breaking into the treasure boxes. It's okay, sir. This is authorised. I'm here with Keith. Yeah. All right. You're going to watch us open the box? Yes, yes. Come on, then. What's your name? Moses. Moses, I'm Brady. Okay, Brady. 